Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for Adulting 101, Travel the World for Less. And we've got a really great program tonight that we are excited about. Um, but before we get started and before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to make a few announcements. Um, my name is Megan Woodward, and I serve as a coordinator in the Center for Student Engagement. We have a lot of great programs happening as we round out February over the next few weeks. Um, of course, today y'all are joining us for Adulting 101. And for those of you who may be close to the Student Union tonight, um, we do have a ball night long starting at six o'clock right after this adulting session. It's gonna be right across the hall in the ballroom. They will be making chocolate covered strawberries, doing some UT coloring and watching the movie, 10 Things I Hate About You. And then next week we have self-watering DIY herbs. And so if y'all want to pick those up, those are going to be in our suite starting on Monday. Um, and our suite is just downstairs in the Student Union of 174. Monday night, we will have Are You Smarter Than the Faculty? So if you're interested in playing along, come join us at 530 in the ballroom here in the Student Union. Tuesday is National Banana Bread Day, such a quarantine staple. Um, so if y'all want to come pick up some banana bread muffins and grab a recipe and get a link for a how-to video, come visit us on Tuesday from 9 to 11.30 at the Art Gallery Lobby here in the Student Union. And then Thursday next week, we will have Graduate Student Bingo. That's going to be a virtual event starting at 6 p.m. So again, lots of great things for all of this and more. Make sure to check out the Vol Life app or visit us on social at ETKCSE. We've got some really good stuff going on. Um, and without further ado, going to go ahead and introduce um, our speaker. We have Ms. Tony Jackson and Kritisha Riley here tonight to talk a little bit more about their experiences with traveling and ways that y'all can travel for less. So again, welcome and hope you guys enjoy. Hey everyone, I hope y'all are doing well. I'm really excited to do this presentation for you all. Um, I love to travel, so I'll do a little brief history. Um, so like Megan said, my name's Tony Jackson. I'm a hall director here at UT, um, but I am a UTK alum. So during my undergrad experience, I got the opportunity to study abroad in Spain for the summer and it was great. And that kind of got my travel bug going. Um, through, since then, I've kind of made it a goal of mine to try to travel internationally every year. And so um, we're just going to share some of our travel tips and tricks and also how to do that on a budget, how to be safe as a student, but also we'll talk about COVID a little bit too. So here we go. Okay, so first we're going to just kind of talk about what's on the itinerary, what's on the plan for today. So we'll talk about tra travel expectations. What do you want to do? What's your purpose? That's so important and an underrated part of traveling. We'll also talk about solo travel versus group travel. We'll talk about the budgeting that comes with that, travel companies, but also student safety and personal safety uh, with travel and then finally, we'll wrap it up with tips and tricks. So things that we've figured out as we've traveled um, and that we think will be beneficial to share with you all. Okay, so setting your expectations. Again, this is such an important part of when you're planning a trip, knowing why do you want to go? What's the purpose? What do you want to get out of this trip? So thinking through, if you're going, I think it's easy to say, I'm going on vacation. Yeah, what, what are you hoping to do on that vacation? So thinking about, am I going to learn about a new place? Am I wanting to explore, go outdoors? Is it for the culture of that place? Is it the history? Also, are you going for a conference, internship? Is it work-related? So he's making sure you have clear expectations and that you know what the purpose is. Also, goals. What are some things that you want to accomplish while you're there? I think it's so important when you figure out where you're going, learning more about the place you're going and thinking, what are three things that I want to do? What are three things that I want to get out of this trip? Um, so when I went to Cuba, when I was in grad school, I was like, I want to watch someone make a cigar. Like I want to firsthand go to a cigar factory and watch that. And so that was something when I went with a group of people, I said, this is 
my top takeaway from this trip. This is something I would like to do. And it resulted in a great story. We met an 80 year old Marigold and she had been making cigars for 65 years uh, since she was 15. So making sure like, what do I wanna get out of this trip? So you can prioritize that because when you're in a new place, it's so easy to just get moving and going. Uh, also the time frame of where you're traveling to can impact your goals um, as well. So figuring out how long are you there? What can you accomplish? And then when you think about the goals, like are they realistic within the time frame? If I'm gonna be here for three days, is it plausible to hit 15 historic sites? Maybe. Um, but more likely than not, thinking about lines, traffic, pro probably not. Also, purpose of goals. So that could be related around where you're going. So again, if you're going to an island, is, do you want to learn how to surfboard? If you're going to um, somewhere that has a historic history like Paris, do you want to see the catacombs? Do you want to go to the Eiffel Tower? And then finally, like one, if your trip is spontaneous, expectations set the tone of the trip. That we would say is the biggest takeaway when you're planning a trip, knowing what you wanna get out of that and being on the same page if you're going with a different group of people. Okay. So which is better, solo travel versus group travel? I think that depends on the, per the person, but also the preference and expectations that you're setting for your trip. So we'll kind of talk about this. Um, it's funny when I was talking to uh, Kratisha about our traveling and our pr preferences, I said, I'm a group travel person. Also, I'm a huge extrovert. Um, so I love talking to people, meeting people. And she's like, oh, I really enjoy to solo travel. I was like, I've never done solo travel. It kind of scares me. Um, but that is definitely up to the person um, and what your preference is. However, here are some benefits of both. So when you solo travel, you get to figure out what do you want to do. Um, and so you get to think about, this is my time. This is my opportunity. It lets you also self-reflect on what you want to accomplish. Um, but also thinking about, on the other hand, if you're traveling by yourself for a week, potentially you could get lonely. Also, the biggest thing, I think, when it comes to solo travel is thinking about price point. When you go with a group of people, you do have the option to split. However, when you're solo traveling, it's just you. Um, so it can get a little pricey. And then also with group travel. So you're sharing time and space, which one, it can deepen relationships. So if you're going somewhere that's really historic or really important to you or important to your history or your family's history, um, it's gonna open up conversations, but also spending a larger amount of time with someone can also deepen relationships too. Also, when you're thinking about a big group of people, if you're going from one place to another, the buddy system, um, I do believe in safety in numbers. Um, and then finally, there could be conflict. So previously I mentioned the time I went to Cuba. Um, I have one person who, whenever I'm ready to travel, I call them up. We met when we were studying abroad um, as UT undergrads. And I'm like, hey, you wanna go here? He's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, let's do it. But when we went to Cuba, we got into a lot of little arguments because we had different expectations. I wanted to lounge and relax. It was spring break. He wanted to hit all the historical sites that we could. Um, so it will teach you how to navigate conflict, but also if you're going with the group, it's important to discuss before you go, what are we gonna do when conflict arises? How do we address this? So it doesn't dampen the entire trip. And then finally, it's less expensive and um, it's less expensive and it can be a different opportunity as a group. So sometimes you get to do things with a larger amount of people that would be harder to do if you were just by yourself. Um, but definitely the pro is being able to split those costs. So solo group travel. So there's pros and cons to each category, kind of like we talked about on the previous slide. However, um, expectations can be met, but it's a little different. And so this is so important. I always, if I'm going with a group, I do a pre-travel planning party. So you get everyone going and you have everyone come in and you have people bring what are one to three things, depending on how many people are going, that you want to do. What are one to three like non-negotiables on your list? And so then at the party, you can kind of help build a makeshift itinerary, especially now during COVID you're gonna need a reservation to do a lot of things. 
So if you have that list, you can be like, okay, we can go ahead and make our reservation to go to this museum or this factory um, because you've already sat down, sit down, talk through it, you know what you want to do. And then also when you're deciding on solo versus group, budget is really important. So you may want to go somewhere by yourself. You may want to have your eat, pray, love moment, but is that fiscally responsible for you at this current time? So maybe you tack on a friend or two. Uh, I will also say there are friends that you are born to travel with and there are friends that maybe you shouldn't travel with. So that is also a learn, that's a trial and error. You really don't know if you can travel with someone um, until you've done that before. So thinking through who would I wanna take on this trip with me? Who has similar expectations? But it all goes back to that communication piece being vital. Okay, budget category. So how do you budget in a cost efficient way? So thinking about transportation, um, flight, train, bus, rental car, the gas that comes with a rental car if you're under the age of 26, thinking about the increased insurance if you are gonna use a rental car, um, and then also, if you decide not to rent a car, taxi and Uber. So last year, I went to Mardi Gras with a group of seven people. And we decided, you know what? We're not far from a lot of places. Let's just not rent a car. No one really wants to drive. It's really hard to find um, parking in downtown New Orleans if you've ever been, especially with parades blocking off streets. So like, we'll just, we'll Uber everywhere. So. We all decided and we all agreed on that. We got back home, we were going through our financial statements, kind of talking through how much did we spend? Did we stay within our budget? Because everyone kind of had agreed we would like to spend, you know, three to five, 300 to 500 for the weekend. Um, well, it was a little longer than a weekend. And so we looked at it and half of it was for Ubers and Lyfts. And we're like, maybe we should have rented a car because if we got two cars and we split it, um, you know, eight ways, it probably would have been a lot cheaper. So that, you know, they say hindsight's 2020, but thinking through what's going to be the most cost efficient for you. Um, also, if you're renting a car, thinking about parking, are you going to Airbnb? Are you going to do a hostel? Does your place of lodging allow you to rent a to park a car there? And then if not, are you going to have to pay for street parking or pay at a garage? Um, and then hotels, what you're going to do for actual lodging accommodations. Um, I will say don't be scared of hostels and don't be scared of Airbnbs. They are all a brand new experience. Um, but there are great ways to travel. And also, if you end up staying at a hostel, you get the opportunity to meet other travelers as well. Um, meals. So thinking about breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. When we go back to tips and tricks at the end, we're definitely going to talk about the importance of bringing snacks um, and how that can help reduce prices. Activities. What do you want to do? Um, so are you going to end up going to a museum that has an entry fee? Are you going to one that doesn't have an entry fee? I think that when people come and have their pre-planning meeting and talking about non-negotiables, also, is there a cost associated to your non-negotiable? And is everyone willing to pay that? It's okay to split if you're like, I would not like to spend money to do this one thing. Um, that is, you know, advocating for yourself and making the trip that you want, setting those clear expectations. Also, it's okay to talk about money. I think we think about it as very taboo, but if you're planning a trip with someone, it's okay to say, this is where I would like to stay for that trip. Um, maps, guidebooks, figuring out, is there any way that you can figure out what you wanna do on a locale? I would always recommend Groupon. They have great deals, walking tours, other types of tours that you may be interested in doing. Then are you gonna get souvenirs? Are you gonna get gifts? I'm not a souvenir person. I feel like my takeaway are the pictures and the memories that I take. But if you are a knickknack person, postcards, magnets, go ahead and do that. Um, so as you're thinking about other categories, what are some things, you know, brainstorm and think about what other categories could be. But these are the ones that we thought were most important when addressing budget stuff. Okay, we will go ahead and start this video. So far, we've talked about group travel and solo travel and ways that you kind of do that in your free time, right? 
Um, but as college students, you also have to think about what you're doing after you leave UT. So it's probably no surprise that as a career coach here at the university, I would have you think about, you know, some of the professional skills or some networking that you have to get under your belt. And so solo travel can come up in that if you think about it more strategically. So things like attending a conference or looking at different opportunities, either as an internship or shadowing or doing research, you know, looking for these experiences in different locations that you may not have traveled to before or places that you've always wanted to go. That's a great way for you to kind of really um, like check two things off of your list at once. And so you can think about, you know, an internship maybe over the summer that you might do out west because you've wanted to go to California and see what that's like. Um, or you think about a conference where you can go network with other students or talk with different professionals in the field um, and pick a location or pick a year that that conference is happening so that you can go to that particular location. That's a little tricky right now with COVID because a lot of things are virtual, but we're finding that a number of internships may be returning to in-person over the summer. So now's a great time to really think about you know, what are some locations you might travel to. Another bonus um, in thinking about how to connect travel with some of the experiences you already have to do is that if you attend a conference or do an internship, you usually can find funding to support it. So internships are paid usually, so that's a great way for you to get um, to still make money and be in a place where you can explore and kind of learn about a new location. Um, and with conferences, they're usually hosted by professional associations, and those usually have a student membership that's often cheaper, and that gives you access to things like scholarships or conference funding, and you can apply that to attending that conference and traveling to network and learn more about the field. So these are, you know, a few examples of ways that you can really uh, travel smarter, not harder, by connecting your travel with some career opportunities. Yeah, I love that she mentioned internships. I got to benefit from a summer internship that was in Malibu. If you ever watch Zoe 101, that's where my internship was at Pepperdine. Um, so working at your, looking at the experience you have and seeing, could you go to another school for the summer and do an internship there? Um, also with conference funding, that is a really big one as well. One, there are huge discounts for students, but most of the time there are additional scholarships as well um, that you could apply for to get your conference fees covered and your lodging covered as well. Um, so travel doesn't just have to be for leisure. It can also be for business. And there are ton, a ton of ways of working within organizations um, or institutions to get that covered. So far, we've talked about group travel and solo travel and ways like that, that you kind of do that in your free time, right? There we go. Okay, um, so thinking about planning your solo or group travel. So um, I have two stories that I want to share with y'all that use both of these. So the first one is Vacation Express. I highly recommend that, that website if you're looking for a more tropical getaway. So one, you'll just kind of put in where you want to go um, and then like the dates you would like to go, how many nights, and they'll kind of put it all together. So uh, a couple years ago, my friends and I were like, we want to go to the beach. We want to do an all-inclusive. We don't want to think about anything. We had just finished working move out, but we just want free time. So we looked at first, we looked at Groupon and then Groupon led us to Vacation Express. So we actually just went in, we clicked our days, we said we wanted to go to the Dominican Republic, um, and then they list all these hotels that are available from different price ranges. Also, Vacation Express and other companies, they have huge discounts and deals. So it's like, we can get away three days out of Nashville for $500, and everything's included from your flight out of Nashville to your resort, um, and then everything's covered once you get to your resort. So we had done all this research and figured out this is, we want to stay at this one resort. Um, and then we changed resorts last minute. And the next morning I woke up and I was like, we'd already booked this trip. And because we were poor students, we did not get trip insurance. Um, and we're like, oh no, 
And then I looked at the reviews and the resort was did not have great reviews. It actually had very bad reviews, but we called Vacation Express and they're like, yeah, we've been getting some feedback about that. We'd be happy to trade you over. Do you have one of mine? And luckily they had a huge deal going on for one of the top five rated resorts in the Dominican Republic. And we got $50 back. Um, so when we were there, everything was covered. We did six nights and we did, we paid for two excursions. And so flights out of Atlanta to the Dominican Republic, six nights, all food. We went ATV riding through the backwoods of the DR. We went on a catamaran, we went snorkeling. And that was all for about $900. So it's a great deal. I highly recommend that you look into that if you're looking to do something in, around Memorial Day or when it warms up or they have great deals for just four day getaways. So if you don't have class, maybe you wanna go. Um, and so then the next year I decided to do go to Europe. And so I went with two of my friends and they're like, Tony, we want you to travel. I will be honest, I am a bougie traveler, but I like to do it on a budget. I'm one of the people where I've, that go, if you wanna stay in a hostel, that's great. Preferably I like Airbnbs, um, just the ability to kind of have my own space. So with that, I had to have a meeting with the two guys I was going to before and they were like, this is how much we wanna spend on lodging. I was like, okay, I can make that happen. And so we ended up traveling, we flew out of Cincinnati, we flew went to Milan, we went to Venice, we went to Rome, Denmark, Iceland, Copenhagen, um, Sweden. And so we were able to do two weeks of a little European travel um, for about 1500. But the thing is that when I planned the first trip to the Dominican Republic through Vacation Express, it was so easy because you just call, you click what you want, and it's done in a, in a you know 30 minutes to an hour. But when you're self planning, especially if you're trying to do it on a tight budget, you just have to take the time and patience to look over things, figure out what you want to do. And sometimes you do have to change your expectations. Is this a trip where I want to treat myself like on everything? Or is this more so a trip where I want to experience a lot, but I also would like to come back home with some money in my pocket too. Um, so it's all about expectations and setting a budget, but very different. I love, I would use the travel company again and I would plan my own trip again. It's just, what can I do with this season in life? But either way you can do both on a budget. So I love planning travel details. Um, I mean, even when my friends and family come to Knoxville, I still have a full itinerary, what times we're going, where we're going. Um, I've incorporated all the things I know they love to do or things they love to eat, the whole nine yards. Um, so thinking about, you know, someone else doing that planning was a little, I don't know. I was like, I'm not sure about this. But what really got me was that it would be a complete surprise to me. And so when I learned about Pack Up and Go um, and the fact that they could do that, I immediately knew I needed to try it. So like I mentioned, Pack Up and Go is the company. They do plane and train trips um, in the continental US and they can do it for up to 12 people. So you could do solo travel, of course, um, but you could also go with a group. And um, really all you need is four weeks lead time. And so that's about the amount of time I think me and my friend took to submit all of the information for them to plan our trip. So step one is to do a pre-trip survey. That's where they ask you a ton of questions about travel preferences, what you like to do when you travel, um, where you wanna eat, sort of activities. For my friend, she's vegan. And so they even you know, took all of that into account as well. Um, and so you give them all this information. They even ask you where you've been recently um, so they don't duplicate that trip. And I thought that was so cool because I think between her and I, when we traveled, it probably was 25 places that we had been um, in the period of time that they asked for. So I knew they would have their work cut out for them. The next step is we're done. So once you fill out that pre-trip survey, you're kind of hands off. And that was a little bit nerve wracking for me and my friend were both very similar planners um, when it comes to travel. But the company really takes it over from there. They do all the booking, they cover, you know, like your travel and accommodations. 
So that's, you know, how you're getting there and then where you're staying once you're there. And they're also getting some details together about things you can do once you arrive. The next step, probably about a week before we were departing, it was, um, we got sent an email. And so that gave us details on things like what the weather would be, recommended packing. Um, I remember at the time, you know, we didn't know where we were going. So they gave us these four clues to help us kind of figure it out. Um, and yeah, all the information you need to kind of get packed. Um, the, I would say our envelope came around that time. So they sent us in a huge thing. They sent us this white envelope that we didn't know at the time, but it had all of the information on our trip and where we were going. We ended up going to Philadelphia, which is really cool to find out as we showed up to the airport. And that really is the last step. You, um, on the day of your trip, they tell you, you know, what time you're gonna depart um, and they check you in for your flight so you don't even have to see that right away. And so the time when you're supposed to head to the airport, um, I got there, I remember like being a little bit nervous, hoping it was gonna be someplace I thought was really cool, um, but also just very excited and feeling a lot of energy around that. And even the people that I saw at the airport, um, the, the security, TSA was like so pumped about where I was going to and the fact that I didn't know until I got to the airport that day. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, we ended up going to Philadelphia and even though it's a place I had been um, years before, I got to experience it in a really new and different way. For one, I got to experience it with my friend, but also they did such a good job of finding all the things that related to what we were interested in. We primarily said we loved history, culture, and food, and they found so many good vegan restaurants for us to try. It was just amazing. We were like not disappointed by anything. We arrived to the hotel and they already knew who we were and they knew that you know we were doing pack up and go so they were really excited about that too um and so it was just all in all it was a really good experience um some pros i would say like i mentioned the itinerary was amazing you know the things they recommended for us to do were great um i love that they could plan for us to come from different destinations so you don't even have to be in the same area my friend was flying from Nebraska and I was coming from Tennessee and they were able to schedule it so that we arrived around the same time. Um, it also was just less headache on the details. It was like a breath of fresh air to be able to just wake up, you know, get to the airport, already know that we had a whole weekend planned um, and we didn't really have to do anything to figure that out. And then it was just really cool to have it as a surprise. Um, that probably is worth, worth it to me. Some of the cons, it is a little bit pricier. Um, we ended up just for fun seeing, you know, what we, based on what we, um, the time we flew, the airline we flew, um, the hotel we stayed at, we kind of price checked it and it was a little bit more expensive, but like I said, I think it was worth it for the amount of detail that went into it. And then it only covers travel and accommodation. So that's something to keep in mind. We still had to pay for food. Um, we still paid for any activities that we did, that we did, but like we talked about in the budgeting slide of this presentation, there are ways that you can, we got around that and ways that you can get around that too. But all in all, if you're wanting to gift someone something, or if you want to just treat yourself in a really cool way, Pack Up and Go is a great option. I love this she told me about it we were meeting before we did this presentation and then we just started swapping like travel stories um and I literally looked it up that night and almost filled out a survey I was like where do I want to go I have a day off soon maybe, maybe I'll try it out um so this is something that's now on my travel bucket list to do um I never really do a surprise travel and I think that's really hard for a lot of people um, because you have a bucket list of places you want to go, but when was the last time you just went somewhere to experience something new? And so this affords you that opportunity. And then also when we were talking about it, she told me, you can set your price range and your price point. So if you're like, I want to go somewhere, but I don't want to spend more than 300 on um, travel and lodging combined, you can also denote that. So I think I like that they work with the people who want to have this experience to travel, but maybe they don't have $1,000 to $1,500 to drop on a trip. 
So I love planning travel details. I think this may happen every time I try to change a slide. Perfect. Okay. So let's talk about safety. So when you're traveling, safety is something that is so important. So thinking about your personal safety, um, what situations are you being put into? Where are you going? Um, and then also like um, being healthy. So as someone with a pre-existing health condition, um, when I went to Cuba, I'm on an insulin pump. I'm a type one diabetic and I don't know why, but my insulin pump broke the minute we landed in Havana and I didn't bring anything additional and my insulin pump at the time worked on batteries and Cuba is there's not a Walgreens on every corner and so I had no idea what I was going to do luckily I had found one battery my emergency battery um, that I put in my suitcase and so that was able to carry me over for the rest of the trip but also thinking about what are things that you need when you travel. So now I have like this full Ziploc duffel bag for if I'm going anywhere um, for the night, it is coming with me after that experience. So if you do have a pre-existing health condition, what is in your safety duffel bag for your health and making sure that you have that set and ready to go. But also getting sick when you're abroad, whether you're international or you're just somewhere that's not home, what's your safety plan? And so we were talking about what our safety plans were. And, you know, myself, I'm like, I just call my mom. Like, I don't know what to do. But thinking through, I should have a developed plan. So one, calling my mom, sharing my location with her, letting her know what my next steps are. Um, and then moving forward based on the, what the symptoms are. But thinking about jet lag, um, we kind of swapped jet lag stories. And so when, she, when Kertisha went to London, she got so sick. Um, and so she actually spent about 48 hours in her hotel room um, because she was jet lagged and had some food poisoning. And then when I went to Spain, I got extremely jet lagged where I was, um, I was laying down in the bathroom of an art museum. Like, like trying to drink so much water. Um, so thinking through when you get sick, what are you doing? What do you need to do? Are you prepared? Um, so as silly it may, as it may sound, like make a little bag, put you know some Tums, some Pepto, some Tylenol, some Advil, Motrin. Um, those are things that you'll be thankful you have. Also, depend, like depending on where you go, they may not have that easily accessible. Um, so making sure that you are able to take care of yourself when it comes to safety stuff as well. And then when it also comes to safety, I think it's important to denote solo versus group travel and thinking about the location. Where are you going? Are you going somewhere by yourself where they speak a different language that you do not know? Um, what, are, what are you going to do there to make sure that you're protected, you're safe? Or if you're going somewhere that may have a potentially high um, crime rate. So the summer I went to the Dominican Republic was actually the summer where a lot of people were coming up missing from the United States who had been there. So we had a full safety plan. My friend and I who went, we were talking to our parents, we were checking in. We always stayed on the resort's Wi-Fi. If we left the resort, we noted the timestamps just to be safe. Um, we, they always say it's better to be safe than sorry. So thinking through based on your health conditions, where you're going, What's your safety plan? And make sure you have that ready to enact if needed. As we prepare to travel, we can't always know the ways that we will need to be safe or um, always be able to keep ourselves safe. But there are some things that we can do in advance, and that's creating a safety plan. And so kind of the first step of really getting this safety plan together is to alert various people that you're traveling. So a couple of things to think about here would be calling your phone or your credit card company to let them know that you'll be traveling. You know, sometimes that's the case domestically, but not as much, but it definitely if you're going international. That way you're not getting to a new destination and you can't, you know, call customer services or call the people that you need to talk to, um, as well as you won't get your money cut off. Sometimes it's good to also consider, you know, carrying some cash as well. But again, you want to be mindful of that when you're traveling. You also, when you think about, you know, alerting people that you're traveling, have a check-in person. So that could be, you know, family, could be friends, um, 
it could be really anybody, but just someone who you can count on being available for you if you do run into trouble or have some issues, but definitely just someone who's like a touch point for you. So that way they know like everything is okay. Even if that's a quick text or WhatsApp message or, you know, other social media posts um, or a phone call that you make. I'm thinking about a trip I took in particular. Um, it was my first international solo trip and I was going for work, but I went to London for a whole week. And so it was a new experience for me and I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, but my mom was my check-in person. So she knew that, you know, at some point in the day, you know, I told her it would be around the time that I was, you know, checking in or kind of staying in for the night, I would reach out to her in some way. So that was a good check-in person for me. The next thing you want to consider is preparing an emergency kit. So this includes any emergency information that you need. So your emergency contact, you also want to um, get any information that you need to contact emergency services in whatever country that you're in, as well as you want to bring extra medication. So if you're on prescription medication, bring, you know, an extra couple of dosage, dosages, words, um, bring some extra of that, as well as a first aid kit. I actually, on this London trip, I ended up getting sick the last couple of days. And thankfully, I had brought things like Dramamine, um, Tylenol, like, um, and like any cold and flu medicine, and that helped me. Um, it wasn't anything that I needed to go to the hospital for, thankfully, but I had that information too if I needed to do that. You also want to understand any potential risk or threats that you might run into as you are drafting the safety plan. So you can research some common travel scams um, and you can also review any travel advisories from travel.state.gov. And so these are great ways for you to just have, you know, an idea of what could happen and you know what to look out for. For me, um, a lot of that work was done for me because I was traveling for work, but kind of one of the things that I think helped me was having you know, a transportation pass. That way I wasn't running the risk of taking rides in what I'm, I might have thought was a taxi, but in reality it wasn't. Um, of course, things like Uber and Lyft exist, exist now, but those are also things that you just want to be cautious of when you're in a new place and you're not really sure how to evaluate the safety of those. You also want to just plan for the unexpected. Unfortunately, like me getting, getting sick, um, I also got lost a lot when I was traveling in London. Um, and so a lot of those things we can't really account for, right? Um, so you want to just plan for ways that you can accommodate some of those things. So maybe you lose something or something gets stolen while you're abroad. You want to get or at least consider travel insurance. You also just want to have a way to safeguard your valuables. If I left anything in my hotel room, it was, you know, it was things that I didn't really worry about getting taken, but I brought things like my passport um, and like, you know, my money and kind of stuff like that. I would bring that in this little cross bag that I could keep in front of me um, and be able to watch at all times. So that's just one way to kind of minimize some of the risk around that. And lastly, you just want to know what your on the ground expectations are. And you can do that, you know, in a number of ways. For me, I, you know, talked to a friend that I knew in London. Um, she lived there her whole life. And so I, you know, talked with her about what are places to go, what are things that I can expect as I, you know, land in, at Heathrow, um, what's the best way for me to get around London um, and the countryside around it. And so she gave me a lot of really good tips as well as just information that I wouldn't have really known um, or it would have been harder for me to find out if I was just looking on the internet. So talk with family, talk with friends who visit the places that you've gone, especially if they've traveled to those places. You can also um, check out the embassy website in that particular country. Um, what's really cool about this, it gives you a lot of information on like health, physical health and mental health resources for why you're there, 
as well as it just tells you things to be aware of as a as a U.S. American going to a different country. Um, and you can actually do this for any citizenship going to whatever country. So you can find information from, from those websites. This might all seem like a little bit of a drag, but in reality, this, this, this just made me more comfortable. Um, it helped me just be more at ease with traveling by myself, but also open up and really explore the country that I was in, the area that I was in, and just feel safe doing that. As we prepare to travel. There we go. Um, so traveling during COVID, um, this, will specific, this slide will specifically talk about flying, but I think it's important to know, you have to understand like what is best for you. So if that's driving and you feel more comfortable doing that, that's great. And if it, you're okay with flying, that also works as well. Um, wherever you're going, you'll need to work with your state's or country's guidelines. Um, the biggest thing with states is if you look at Alaska and Hawaii, um, they do kind of treat themselves as if they were another country when it comes from entering one state to another. Um, also, you want to, if you're flying, you want to look at the airline's policy and how that has changed um, in regards to masks being worn, their seating. I think it's easy to think. Um, I know when I watch all these travel videos right now on TikTok, everyone's like, there's like 10 people on my flight. Um, well, I went to Hawaii in December and there were not 10 people on my flight. It was actually a very full flight, surprisingly. Um, so knowing the guy, I think if I would have, wish I would have looked over the airline's expectations so I would have been better prepared of, oh, there's actually a person sitting right next to me and they both have dogs in their lap which I'm a huge dog person. So that wasn't a, a big deal, but knowing like what does the policy look like in regards to COVID um, because you don't want to end up on an airline's no fly list. And so talking about location. So I want to talk a little bit about the prep work going into going to Hawaii in December. Um, so Hawaii does require a negative COVID test and it has to be dated 72 hours before you land in Hawaii. And it has to be a, cer a certain test. So it had to be a nuclear amplified test. Um, and then if you didn't do that, then you had to have, so I unfortunately got COVID right around Thanksgiving. And so my timeline of going to Hawaii was about 17 days after my diagnostic day and, and 15 days after my test day. So I actually couldn't do the test because there was a still chance that I would end up with a positive test result. So I had to get upload a doctor's note I had to upload two forms of identification. Um, I also had to go and do an exemption request through the state of Hawaii's government and get that approved before I can even get there. Um, so you need to know what the expectations are when you're traveling somewhere, whether most, most places it's a 72 hour test, but some places it has to be a certain test. So for Hawaii, you had to get an AFC. That was one of the only places if you wanted a negative test that you could get it in the city of Knoxville. Um, and then because it is that nuclear amplified um, test, sometimes that's not the same as a rapid test that we're so used to. So you have to read the instructions thoroughly. So that makes it more difficult if you are choosing to fly somewhere. And just looking over at other countries, they have that same rule. Most of them at 72 hours from landing and it has to be a certain type of test because of the reliability of it. Um, so overall, we were prepping a month before we even got there. So we had to send the flight information to the Hawaiian government when we got to Hawaii. We had to do a check-in every day saying that we weren't showing symptoms. Um, we had to let them know the locations of our Airbnb, our timeshare that we were staying at. And you have to do this all prior and get it approved. And then from there, transition into having your test results out and ready once you get to um, the airport, because as soon as we got off the plane, it's kind of like going through customs at a different country. They're like, let me see your test results um, and make sure that you're negative or make sure that you have this clear exemption so you don't have to quarantine. Because if you don't come with the right test, then you have to quarantine for two weeks. Um, if you break that quarantine, they do have the right to take legal action. So if you are traveling during COVID, specifically flying, Make sure that you know the expectations and the standards for where you're going. We're getting a lot of information about whether we should or should not travel during COVID. 
So hear me out. By all means, I think travel should be minimized during this time. I think that's the only way that we can really keep ourselves safe and keep others safe. However, it's going on a year and unfortunately having to go places like to work um, or back home to see your family or to check on, you know, individuals who may be sick or, you know, you just need to check on, it just might be inevitable um, that we'll have to travel at some point. And so some ways to kind of think about um, how you can travel during COVID um, via the road, you know, kind of driving places. I have a couple of tips for you. I've traveled, you know, by the time that I'm recording this video, I've traveled at least two different times during COVID. Um, and the most recent one was for a wedding. And I, you know, went back and forth about whether I should do it or not. But, you know, my friend only gets married, hopefully one time. So I decided that if I were gonna do this, I wanted to do this as safely as possible. So one of the first things I did was take a preemptive quarantine. Um, so I was able to minimize the amount of people I was around for about two weeks before I was headed to Florida. Um, and so I did a preemptive quarantine just to make sure that I wasn't sick um, or had the possibility of being exposed to COVID before going. You can also get tested and or vaccinate at this point before traveling anywhere. So I definitely recommend doing that too. You also want to check the COVID guidelines for the state or the area that you're traveling to. So for this Florida trip, I was specifically going to a county that for a while had um, checkpoints. Um, and so I checked just to make sure if I needed to provide a negative COVID test result or if they were even allowing um, out-of-state residents to travel to that county at that point, and they were, so I was good to go. But you wanna check that um, before you start to plan a, tra plan a trip or travel somewhere. Um, the next thing I did, because you know I'm in my car and I'll need gas and food at some point, um, it's about nine hours to where I was going in Florida. And so I plotted out my gas and my, my rest stop breaks. Um, this was kind of tricky because not all places along the highway have um, like a website or a way for you to know what's there. Um, but I was somewhat familiar with the route since Florida is where I grew up. Um, so I picked larger gas stations, usually gas stations that were designed for truckers because they had um, bigger saws, they usually had cleaner um, facilities for you to use, and they're usually attached to a restaurant. So that way I could stop at once and get food and go get gas. So that's something to think about, a way for you to really minimize the amount of time that you stop can help reduce your, reduce your risk as well. Anytime I made a stop, I had my COVID kit, which helped me keep myself safe during that time. So I had things like gloves, hand sanitizer. I had disposable mask because then I didn't have to worry about my cloth mask getting dirtier than what I wanted it to. I had Lysol. I had some of the common medications that they recommend if you're fighting COVID. So like Tylenol or ibuprofen. I had cold and flu medicine. Um, zinc, things like that. So I had some of the, like basically like a little starter kit to help me if I did somehow become exposed or started to develop symptoms. But you have this COVID kit because it helps you, again, like decrease the amount of things that you're touching. So gloves you can throw away, disposable masks you can throw away, and so you're not, you know, potentially reinfecting yourself. Another big thing I did was set expectations for the trip itself. So I was going to a wedding, so I asked a ton of questions about, you know, who was coming, would it be outdoors, um, what were, you know, the bride's expectations for wearing a mask during the ceremony, um, but just in general, getting an idea for what, you know, my friend wanted of me when I traveled, and thankfully she was, you know, just as conservative as I was. I was wearing a mask at all times, basically. 
um, and I minimized the amount of time I spent indoors with other people. And so because we were on the same page, it wasn't awkward at all when I showed up in my full face guard um, and wearing gloves and things like that. So setting those expectations in advance helps just make it a little easier, a little less awkward for you once you arrive on your trip. And then ultimately just stick with your plan. Um, like I said, this is a weird time. It's so awkward. Um, but I was so grateful that I had the hard conversations in advance because then I got to just show up and enjoy, you know, the festivities and still hang out with people. But I did so in a way that kept them safe and kept me safe too. And so making sure you have your plan and stick with it is going to ensure you can do that in the best way possible. Sweet. So finally, we're going to end with some tips and tricks. So one, I talked about snacks earlier. This is something like when you're all, like, if you choose to fly and they give you snacks, like always say yes, because you never know you'll be laying at your Airbnb or your hotel and it'll be 1 a.m. You're like, man, I wish I had those bag of pretzels. Um, so like take your snacks. You can always eat them later. If you're a big snacker, you can pack those too. And those can be meal meal replacements. Also, if you have a hotel that has a continental breakfast, like grab some extra fruit or something. And that's something you can take while you're out um, exploring the city. So don't be afraid to use snacks so you don't feel like you have to sit down and pay for a $20 meal wherever you're at. Also, don't be afraid to grocery shop. Um, I think it's like, oh, I'm on vacation. I don't need to pack groceries. So when we were in Hawaii, our Airbnb had this avocado tree. Um, and so we passed the, I want to say gas station because we passed the grocery store and I thought about it and we're like, hey, let's pull over. And so we got some eggs and we got some toast. And so we did egg and avocado toast in the morning. So that's one meal that we didn't have to pay for. Also, we saw that our Airbnb had a coffee maker. And so we're huge coffee people. So instead of paying, you know, $5 every morning for a week, we were able to make our own coffee there in our Airbnb. So it's things that, think about quick little things you can do that can kind of replace costs that add up very quickly. Um, so don't be intimidated to go grocery shopping. Um, just grab some things that you think may be helpful and food that you'll enjoy too. Um, when you're packing, think about what can I take? What can I bring with me? Um, something that I do when I pack, specifically my packing procedure, um, is that I always put my shoes in a like Walmart bag or a Target bag. Um, one, I don't want my dirty shoes to touch my clothes, but then also considering what if you end up going hiking and there's dirt or there's mud on your shoes, that's not something you may want to track back with you and all your luggage. So just be mindful when you're packing. Sometimes you feel like you may want to take 18 billion things. You're like, well, I couldn't eat this outfit or this outfit. It's important to plan out what you're going to wear. It's bring extras if that's going to suit you, but can you fit it all in a carry-on? I'm a big fan of only using a carry-on instead of paying for a check bag. Um, so that means I plan out what I'm going to wear every day and I try it on to make sure I like how it looks. And yes, that requires a lot of prep work, but I think it's better than paying $60 for a check bag. Like I said, I'm bougie, but I like to budget. Um, and then also utilize the locals who are there wherever you're going. They have so much knowledge and you don't know what you don't know. Um, so when I went to South Korea, I was like, what are some things that I have to do that I never would have thought? And they're like, have you heard of indoor baseball? And I was like, I know baseball, but indoor baseball is a big thing in South Korea. And so we went to an indoor baseball game. So ask questions. If you're staying at an Airbnb, ask your host. Um, and then as you're meeting people, like, be like, hey, what are some things that I should do here? Um, because people take pride in where they're from and they'll want you to have the best experience you can. Um, take risk, but also have fun and be safe. Um, and then considerations. I personally, if I can, I always try to get an international phone plan if I'm going to be somewhere longer than about four or five days, if I'm going out of the country. That just gives me a peace of mind and that's my safety plan. So one, if I get lost, I can open my maps, I can use my data and I can get myself back where I need to be. If I'm scared, I can call, call my mom back, hey, I'm here, I can FaceTime her, she can screenshot it, she knows exactly where I am in case I don't get back to where I was going. 
Um, so that's something to also think about. What is going to think about things that will make your trip worthwhile? And finally, have fun um, and do something that you want to do. Um, so that is all for our presentation. I'll open it up for questions via the chat, or you can just unmute yourself if you have any. So if there are not any questions, um, we'll go ahead and end this presentation. I think ball night long is happening at six. So if you're around campus, come on by. Um, and then Megan, do you have any closing things? Thank y'all again so much for joining us tonight for adulting. Um, we have recorded this presentation and I will be sure to touch base with Tony for Tisha to get the presentation PowerPoint um, and make it available to y'all as well. I know there were some technical difficulties, um, but if y'all wouldn't mind too, um, check out the Vol Life app. That's where you can find out, out about all of our events um, as well as social media at ETKCSE. And we will see you for our next Adulting 101 in March, March 11th, after our housing fair, talking about housing options, if you're looking into that. So thank you all once again, and hope you all have a great night.